first and then conference at some, and then you can then click and select what conference ID you see on in 2019. Enter the access code ID then 2019 SC. That is solid Wi-Fi for us to use only. No one else uses that Wi-Fi. It is only for us to use. And then we love you to interact with us on the slider uh, to access this app. This app is to make questions and allow you to express opinions on live phones. Search for slider on Google or just type in slider and it will ask you to enter the event code hashtag IPM19. I would love you to do so now. Get connected because you guys will be allowed as delegates of IPM to question the speaker whilst the speaker is busy talking and make some statements as well. Uh, of the topic and break the speaker and please take part on the polls as everybody is doing so well uh, on the polls uh, this morning. So welcome again and to the speakers that are here, Dr. G, uh, welcome to everybody that is here, the room will start filling up slowly. Also just also like to thank the technical team around us, the camera guys and the sound people and our beautiful volunteers at the back, I want to show just give them a round of applause because they do really well. And then I would also like you to give me a round of applause for my blue shirt I have on today. <laughs> because no one seems to get the memo when I speak to the IBM people that today when I wear blue, they must wear blue, but I see Dr. G's got a blue ball shirt. It's just fine. Yesterday was white, and I think tomorrow we'll make it pink and we'll see. Anyway, let's, um, let's start and, and, and bring up the first speaker. I think before I do that, um, can we just make it very, very clear? Uh, and also, a huge apology yesterday for change, sudden change in the breakaway rooms which caused much confusion, but thank you for working with us, um, you know, moving between rooms and, you know, I was sort of a walking program yesterday when people saw me, they were asking the topic, and I miraculously had to know what the room was in, without walking with the actual program. So, uh, I am not the walking program, I'm the walking director, the, the, the walking program director. I'm the, probably the program director. Program, but I could manage to help everybody. Thank you for your patience yesterday. I would like to now just announce so you can get your programs out um, on the breakaway sessions on page 25. Grab your pens, which are provided in front of you, and let's um, just mark off the breakaway sessions, the change of rooms. Please note that Kratan, Lupata, and Chawa is no longer used, and I will tell you why. It is far away. All right? I see there's a few people just battling to get down uh, to the to the area where you walk down the stairs and see our people is struggling and they come back up after they've eaten food. I have helped a few people yesterday <laughs> and some of them are losing a lot of kilojoules after consuming kilojoules, they're losing when they come to the top. So these rooms were just as far as that. So we brought them closer to you. So um, session nine, essential skills and reporting will no longer be at the cut up breakaway, it will now be at Warriors 1. So Warriors 1 is the room where you believe to your left, around to the registration area. Warriors 1. Session 10, which was the part of breakaway, where a fourth industrial revolution and disruption of each system panel discussion will take place, that is now Warriors 2. Warriors 2. Okay. Session 11, which was scheduled to Chawa Breakaway, will be courageous and mindful leadership will be discussed. That will now be at Sears 1, which is, when you look to the back, you see Sears 1, the first room, where you exit this hall. Session 12, Authentic Leadership Masterclass, which was supposed to be scheduled at the King's Ballroom, is now at Sears 2, which is also just behind you. The reason why we are not using the key ballroom is because. Gala. Did someone say the gala? So you can understand why we are shifting here around, right? I, there must be teamwork. We must understand why we are doing things. It is for the gala dinner event tonight. Who's all coming to the gala dinner event tonight? By show of hands. One, two, three, four, five, six, six. Only nine people. <laughs> so only one can go. And we'll, we'll get a violin. Just to play for us. No DJ, we can carry out for the evening. So only nine people is coming to us tonight. Um, nine tuxedos, four tuxedos, and five ladies, I think. Nine. Okay, um, so let's continue. I, uh, the speaker that I'm bringing up, uh, well, obviously I have a pleasure of bringing up, uh, I, I had to remind him um, that I 
either facilitated a panel in Emperor's Palace, I think it was years ago, where I brought you up with, um, with another speaker that was with me. Um, and now I have the honor of bringing, bringing you up today again. And a really, really, really top topic. And we start the morning off really, really on a high. Okay, on a high. I want you to fire as many questions to our next speaker on Slido with regards to this topic that we're going to discuss. First of all, the topic uh, that, we're going to discuss, that he's going to be talking about this morning is new horses for new courses, holding leadership capability of large scale change, competitiveness, and complexity. The speaker holds a Bachelor of Commerce degree from Rhodes University, an MBA from the University of Cape Town, where I reside from, and a PhD from the University of Washington. A lecturer in the field of strategy and leadership, and the founding dean of the Gordon Institute of Business Science. Gibbs, as we all know it, he has extensive experience in South Africa as well as overseas working with executive teams in companies to assist them in developing strategy and to ensure effective leadership. I would like to read this because we agreed we're not going to, but when I read it, I felt it, it gave context to the topic. In his view, South Africa faces significant challenges similar to many countries of its time. Unless we are able to generate and create an effective set of infrastructures, just in broadband as an example, strengthen, make more agile and creative and also accountable institutions that provide service to society in an effective manner, this economy is unlikely to grow. Finally, unless individuals are given the room to really make a difference through effective leadership and decision making, it is unlikely South Africa will be able to achieve its goals of prosperity, inclusiveness, and social justice. Ladies and gentlemen, also, the speaker is a visiting lecturer at the Rotterdam School of Management. I want you to put your hands together for our speaker, Professor Nick Benedal, Professor of Strategy Leadership. appreciate the, the privilege of being in this time. 
We also in a time of remarkable transformation, not just in the word, in the use of the word that we use, transformation in South Africa, but in the transformation of societies, how we work, how we organize, of how we live. And I'll give you some data to back this up. Forty years ago, fifty years ago, there were two billion people in our seven and a half billion people on the planet. And it's true we face a great question about how do we sustain our planet, which will be a challenge for this generation and the next. But the truth is we are, the, are three times more people on this planet than there were 40, 50 years ago. After two terrible world wars, one in Europe, one in Europe and Asia, we've had 70 years of peace. We've removed the shackles of colonialism. And some people fear we're under new forms of outside control, but compared to the kind of colonialism that Africa suffered under, and Asia and Latin America, in the last 60, 70 years, we freed ourselves from that. We have become nations with our own destinies under our own control. If I look at education, something all of you in this room are probably very focused on, if I look at how education systems have changed, how literature and literacy and access to information is now all over the world. I often think of a young kid in Bangladesh who has 4G, who has access to the same information, maybe not all the same knowledge, but the same information as a kid in California. This is a revolution. It has never happened before. Human history. If I look at healthcare and the numbers about healthcare and show how healthcare has become a public good, almost a right all over the world in the last 40 or 50 years. I look at science and engineering and of course this thing that we're all immersed in, this thing you're all studying all day, I'm sure, the impact of the digital economy on how organizations work and create value. We are living extraordinary world. We are hurtling into a digital economy in which the chip and all the appliances and tools and systems that allow us to communicate instantly at very low cost all over the world is a revolution. We live in an extraordinary time. But of course the truth is there are still a billion people who've been left behind. Somebody in Zambia today will live half the length of life of somebody in Japan. And a person in Zambia today will earn 1% of what someone in America will earn in their lifetime. These inequalities are more and more visible. And this is why you're seeing all over the world, in Chile, in Hong Kong, in Eastern Europe, all over the world, even in the United States, a resentment from people who are being left behind. And today I particularly want to address those of you from the public service, from government, who serve us as citizens. And all over the world as we look at winning nations or nations that are struggling, one of the great differences is the quality, efficiency and innovation and joined upness of the state. With technology we have available today, that allows us to redesign processes, redesign organizations, winning nations all over the world. The state has become a provider of service to empower our institutions and individuals in the world. Because I'm fortunate to travel so much, I spend much of my time not only reading, but also going to these countries to try and understand what's the chemistry what are the practices, what are the attitudes these countries have that have achieved so much, even in your lifetime? And I see the same things in almost every country I go to. The drumbeat is the same. An intolerance for inefficiency. A sense of urgency and a need for speed. The realization that no one's going to do much for us as a country, we have to do it for ourselves. A sense of self-empowerment and freedom 
that says, in this country, we hold our future together. A realization that we need each other inside a country. That a country is like a team of soccer players, or cricket players, or sport, or rugby, whatever it is. That the whole team has to function, the society has to function. There has to be trust. There has to be respect. There has to be communication between the state, the economy, and society. Because if there isn't, in this fast-changing world, a country will get left behind. On Sunday, I flew back from Europe during the daytime, and I flew over the Congo, which I do three or four times a year. And I looked over the vast landmass of the DRC, which really should be the Brazil of Africa. It's got 80 million people, almost unlimited natural resources. And yet, I'm not sure in modern terms we could define the DRC as a functioning state. I go to Singapore, which is a small island, where 60 years ago, 70 years ago, the average Singaporean, when the British left, and the Singaporeans threw them out, which wasn't a bad idea, then began their journey to build their country. The average Singaporean earned $600 a year. Today, the average Singaporean earns more than the average American, more than the average European. They have no natural resources. They import 90% of their food. I want to go there often because I'm energized by their energy. They also have my height, which is very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm energized by their energy. And like you, I want to look for where the best practice is, and I want to go there, and I want to learn. And my motto, I'm sure yours is the same, which is learn from everyone and copy no one, because none of us face the same circumstances. But all of us in this 21st century are caught up in this tidal wave of change. Alvin Toffler in 1979 wrote a book called Future Shock. 1979, 40 years ago, in which he said that the speed of change will be so fast that he doesn't understand whether societies, organizations, or individuals will be able to keep up with the speed of change. You are the experts at managing that curriculum. You are the stewards of productivity. You are the holders of human capability. You are the leaders you have to shape an environment in which thousands, millions of people in this country will either do productive work or find themselves frustrated because the system doesn't work, because the decisions aren't made, because resources are wasted, and because people around them think we have forever to get this right. We don't. We have very, very little time. I think it's generally acknowledged now that we had a 10-year period in which we lost our way. And we are now beginning to recover, beginning of the recovery process, which will take a long time to get our institutions to innovate, to change, to deliver to the people of South Africa. The people of South Africa are not indefinitely patient. There is something about us that I don't quite follow. We are extraordinarily patient we tolerate performance at levels we should never tolerate. And they are knocking on the door. When I go to townships and rural areas and work with young high school learners at Gibbs, where we run programs with them, they are looking at your generation, asking, what is it you're doing to create value, to create the opportunities for them to succeed? And the pace of that knocking on the door will not slow down. Economic growth is the oxygen of democracy. Let me say that again. Economic growth is the oxygen of democracy. Without economic growth, there cannot be further transformation. Because without economic growth, there's no more tax. And as you all know with Moody's, we have borrowed to the max. We've maxed out the country's credit card. We are at risk. And countries these days don't rely on natural resources the way they used to. They rely on knowledge. And ideas and money and people can flow around the world easily. We truly live in a global society. 
So we're going to live in a world that is beyond our recognition. We're going to create a world, in a digital world, in a competitive world, in a world that's open to learning from everybody, that our grandparents would simply not recognize. And the countries that do that, and the individuals that do that, will be the winners. They will capture the great advantages of this massive South Africa has been working on this project now for 25 years. In one way, 25 years is a very long time. We go to university and we do a degree in three, four, in 25 years, we should be able to get a great deal done. We have. We're in this room as HR leaders, and we look around us and we can see the progress. But I would suggest to you today, it is not fast deep enough. This is a country of growing inequality, where rural people are left further and further behind, where the periphery of our cities, which should be the engines of innovation, are overwhelmed by the numbers of people who come to our cities and we're unable to cope. And the paradox is that Santon is the centre of the centre of the African that there is no other cluster of companies and banks and stock markets anywhere on this continent of 1.3 billion that comes even close to what competitive, complex intensity we have in Santa. Maybe let me broaden it and let me call it Gauteng. As you probably know, Gauteng is 3% of the land mass but 35% of our economy. I think Gauteng would be the 10th biggest economy in Africa. We are living in an in a extraordinary environment where all around us are institutions and infrastructure that we can turn to good use and the time to do it is now. So let me share with you one or two thoughts about what leaders need to think about. I'm sure you've been thinking about it. I don't know why this conference I've come to many times, and I'm always intrigued as to what you hope to learn. Because I'm intrigued about what you hope to learn, because that will inform what you're going to do when you leave at the close of the conference. What have you come to learn? What insights do you need? Have you got an action plan that's in front of you as you sit in these sessions? This is what I'm going to do. Somebody once said that action is the enemy of thought. That the busier we get, the less we think. Or as Alice Wonderland said, if you're not careful, you'll end up where you're headed. So this is a time to reflect, to let go, to leave behind all the pressure of your office, and to sit and think about, why am I in the room? What are the stakes? What are people asking me to do as a leader? in this most important part of any organization. This part that deals with the human capital that makes organizations do what they do. Why are we in the room? What I'm clear about is, as I've just said, how we've got into the room. The habits, the systems, the experiences that have got us in the room are not going to get us out of the room. If we're going to grow this economy, we're going to have to restructure the economy. We're going to have to restructure the way we work. We're going to have to take advantage of this enormous wave of technology that is empowering us all at a rate that's absolutely remarkable. We're going to have to buy very shrewdly. We're going to have to pick our partners very carefully, both companies and countries, to make sure that our country, that our people are energized by having the right tools in Johannesburg 45 years ago, we were a mining economy. And you are sitting in a, in a complex that was part of Bufututwana, if you remember Bufututwana. And you are sitting in the richest platinum belt in the world. And we were a mining economy. When I first made my first international flights, the first item on the news was the gold price. Because this was a mining economy. It is no longer South Africa 
is a services economy. Financial services, technical services, professional services, government services. has been a massive revolution. And you know what happens when a revolution happens slowly? Maybe you miss it. Martin Luther King wrote from jail in Alabama in Birmingham. He said the tragedy of revolutions is many people sleep through them. Because it happens slowly and you suddenly find yourself in the wrong place. The thing that's so important for you to take from this meeting is that we can avoid that. We can deliver growth. We can transform our country. We can govern more efficiently. We can hold leaders accountable. And we can be accountable leaders. We have everything we need to get that right. When I think about leaders and what we have to do, I think about three eyes. The first eye is in a modern state, in a modern nation, in a modern society, you have to have the right infrastructure. Now, infrastructures change so dramatically. When I was a youngster, maybe it was the rail and the port and the airports. Today, infrastructure is broadband. And if you're in a country with expensive broadband or narrow penetration of broadband, you are not part of the global Yes, rail and roads matter. I look at the extraordinary story of e-tolling, or of uh, what's this fine system called in Khartoum? What do we call it? Not the Khartoum, the fines. That story's been run. What's it called? The demerit system. The demerit system. Isn't that just what's the name? Arto. 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 We've been doing Arto for 15 years. For 15 years we've spent 500 million of your money, even worse, of the poorest people's money. And we still don't have a system. This is just impossible. So I think of infrastructure, I think of the state not being in the economy so much, but regulating the economy. Building the next wave of organizations that are going to make us a modern state. Government's not connected. The, the dots don't connect. If you go to Barra as a patient and you stand in outpatients, you will fill out a long form with a pen, and then someone will see you eventually. Then you'll go to ABSA who will recognize you instantly. Then you go to Child Take Care and you fill out another set of forms. But ABSA will still recognize you instantly. Your bank online, government, local, mainly local, has got to change. These departments that are so vital as water becomes more and more important in a resource shortage environment, as electricity generation becomes so key because it's a basic infrastructure. We're in danger of not having the infrastructure to serve our people. And I often find the attitude of government, although recently it's changed dramatically in the last 18 months, do not regard themselves as the servants of society. They regard themselves as the custodian of everything. This has to change. When I go to winning countries, government officials are servants of our people. In practice, not in theory, not in some charter, in practice. So infrastructure becomes everything because a state that doesn't regulate properly and efficiently, look at how slow our policy making is in digital. It's just too slow. The game will be over. So we have to speed up. So infrastructure is the first eye. The second is institutions. And I've talked enough about them. In modern life, from the time you're born to the time you're at the other end of life, you are in the hands of institutions. Institutions make or constrain your life. If you have long queues, if people make errors in the system, in your bank or wherever it is, society closes down. People lose hope. People aren't free to use their natural talents to do well. My great-great-grandfather did not need institutions. I've been studying pre shopping economics. Zulu, Zulu economy pre-sharp, before-sharp. 
The Umuzis didn't need a government. They were self-sufficient. They grew their own food. They made their own tools. They built their own homesteads. They didn't need a state. We are the victims or the beneficiaries of the state. What I've learned is that good politics makes good economics and bad politics makes bad economics. So infrastructure and institutions. We have a private sector that is not moving fast enough, either in terms of changing the basis of its economy or its commitment to real transformation. And yet we have a very big private sector. It's the biggest part of our economy. By far, it pays most of the taxes on which the states depend. In fact, many companies are either not investing or leaving. Many of our biggest companies are no longer here. I remember 10 years ago saying to government, here are the 10 biggest companies that are South African companies. If you go and study them, the Anglo-Americans, they're not here anymore. SAB Miller is now Brazilian. Anglo is in London. A country has to invite business to invest. That doesn't mean it should sell out to business. It means it should invite business. It should engage with business, foreign business. We want multinationals. Why do we want multinationals? Because our citizens want the best products and services available in the world. I know of no successful country that isn't open to the best of the next generation of technologies, of systems, of products. And yes, while we do that, we must develop our own. <coughs> so three things. Third is individuals. A great nation, a great organization, is one where individuals are able to perform at their maximum. What I've learned working with HR for so many years is that all work is voluntary. You've come to this conference and you will choose what to get from it and what to do with what you've experienced. Work is voluntary. We choose our hard to work. Let me ask you this. How many of you drive to work the same route most days? Most? Yes, let me see again. That's a shy voting in Savannah. Yeah, most of you. Do you ever wake up when you get to work? <laughs> <laughs> this is the habits that we have, right? We're doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. We're not paying attention to the change. We're just carrying on doing what we're asked to do. This will never, these are for managers. I'm not in student management. You're not in student management. You're at this conference for fearless leadership, of setting the standard, of going first. And all work is voluntary. Why I've always loved HR is because HR's job is not only the systems of remuneration and the bargaining and the training, it's about the motivation of humans who come to an organization. And they will choose how hard to work. We inspire them and we share our knowledge with them and we motivate and communicate and reward them, they will work. Let me give you an example. In, nine, in the middle of the 1980s, Toyota had 30,000 workers in Japan. I've told the story for years. How many suggestions do you think they got from 30,000 people in one year? So I want you to talk to your neighbor. Have a chat to your neighbor. How many suggestions from 30,000 people in one year? Turn around maybe, talk to someone that you haven't talked to before. <laughs> How many suggestions? 30,000 you know, people. You know they invented, uh, they invented the suggestion. This is human suggestion. So, and they're very, they're very loyal. So I, I really imagine that... Uh, if you have 30,000 employees in a year, on average, each one of them will be five or six years. A year. Are you done? Uh, is it in one year? One year. I'm gonna, I've, I've got a fantastic prize. You. 
it's a lot. I've got to interrupt you yeah. because we're short of time. If you take uh, I've got a, I've got a slightly used bottle of water surprise. <laughs> and each one of them. Of the back there? Anybody want to guess? You can see Shout each one of them. Gentlemen, the green shirt in the last row. Ten, with your fingers like that. Yes, sir, I can see you. I'm not spent. Shout out to another. I would say it's around 120 what? times 30,000. High five to you too, but it's not a number. <laughs> 20 suggestions in one year from 30,000 people. No. Sis. <laughs> Try again. What about the, what about the full paying VIP delegates who've got? They must have a really good answer. Uh, what do you think? 300. 300, that's pathetic. We've got from 20 to 300. Anybody else? Yes, sir. 30,000. 30,000, I've got 30,000 over here. Anybody with 30,000? 30,000 over here. 1,000. 100,000. 100,000. 100,000, you've gone the wrong way. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. The answer is 3 million. How do you get 3 million suggestions from 30,000 people? <laughs> I'll give you another chance to win a slightly used bottle of water. <laughs> What percent of these suggestions were practical enough to be used? Talk to your neighbour. One percent of suggestions were practical enough to be used. One percent. One percent. No, it has, it has to be more than that. It has to be more yeah, than that. that. It's it's practical enough yes. to be used. Yes. One percent of 30. Oh. Maybe 20. <laughs> 20. Okay, who's going to open the bidding? No, no, you don't count. You, too, you know too much already. Who's going to open the gentleman with the green shirt? He's opening the bidding. It's his second chance. He's so wishing he didn't come this morning. Go. Go. The answer is 90%. What is it? Now let me ask you to stop for a minute and think about what I said. All work is voluntary. Our job as HR leaders is to create environments in which which people will volunteer their maximum effort by doing the right things. In other words, changing how we're running the organization. We are running our organizations for the last century. We are not running agile, fast, technology-driven organizations. We're moving, and I'm generalizing, so forgive me. But as a customer, as a victim of slowness, we are in danger. What is driving this tremendous speed? It's the algorithm. And if you are uncomfortable with the word algorithm, I suggest get comfortable with it. Go and find out how the digital world is shaping us. Because we're still having meetings. Have you, we still go to meetings. How many meetings do you go to? How much of your time? Meetings. What time are these? <laughs> this, these tools, this speed, has to change the structure of organizations. As a friend of mine said to me, a, a meeting is not a legitimate form of work. Because nothing really happens in meetings. Maybe it's matters arising in the next meeting. <laughs> We've got to re-engineer our organization. Systems and people and the attitude of us all. That's the leadership we need. There's an American expression that says you can't jump a chasm in two jumps. Chasms take one jump. We don't have much time. Do you agree with me broadly? That if we don't grow this economy, this next generation will not tolerate it. Mm. Do you agree with me? Mm. Yeah. We see it all over the world. In Chile this week, Chile is an advanced economy. The people are saying, ah, now I learned to speak Pluto last year. Ooh, eh. <laughs> <laughs> They're not tolerating it anymore. They have the right not to tolerate it. We have the right to hold the state accountable. We have the right to ask ourselves in the SOEs, what have we done as a generation to create an environment in which a few SOEs are holding the entire economy to ransom, totally indebted? And 
can't blame the people in Islam. But we have to ask as a society, what did we not do in public education that 25 years later we are producing largely young people leaving school who are not employable in the fourth industrial revolution? Mm -hmm. We must ask that question. That's our question. We are the professionals. We are the middle class. It's our question to answer why are we tolerating this. So before I get too excited, let me just share with you what I think are the drumbeats of leadership that we need in the years ahead. And I encourage you to absorb what you hear here in this conference. And then write yourself an action plan for the next, how many days we've got? Let's call it 90 days. What will you do in the next 90 days? They say action is the enemy of thought, but too much thinking is the enemy of action. We spending too much time, yada, 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 and not enough time doing what needs to be done. You know, at Gibbs, we have a big research program, and we've figured it out now. I can release today the information. We have discovered the secret of organizational success. Would you like to know what it is? It's HBW, hard bloody work. <laughs> we have very little time. You know, I'll share this one thing before I wrap up. South Africa has become an island. We're an island nation. What do I mean by that? Well, two-thirds of our border is sea, and the closest thing is the Antarctic, from which we only get coal. Not much other inspiration. Our neighbors are small economies, some doing right, some disastrous. We don't have a match rival who's in our face. If you are German or French, you wake up every morning wondering if the other bastards are going to invade you again. Because <laughs> they've invaded each other so many times. European history is full of rivalry and contest and argument and conflict. We sitting in splendid isolation, the wealthiest country in Africa, with the best institutions, with the best infrastructure, but we're sleeping. Ethiopia is not sleeping. Go to Ethiopia. You will see human Go to Lagos. Lagos is a city of 18 million people. It's the busiest city I've ever been to in my life. More than Shanghai, more than Mumbai, more than New York, and more than London. But they have no infrastructure and very weak institutions. We should be the driver of this entire continent mm. in the next, in your lifetime. One billion people untouched by what you've taken for granted before 10 o'clock in the morning. This is our potential. And then we've got to reach down to this next generation. And as, as one of our MBA students, Mankova Zungu, says, lift as we rise. As we rise, we must lift them and, and, and make sure they have access. It's not, about, it's not about writing the pasts of the wrong only. It's about saying to a generation, access. Let's give them access. Let's redesign our organizations so that information flows, decisions are pushed down. We educate that generation. They have to be better than us. If they're not significantly better than us, I think you can kiss your pension to the bottom. Because growth is the oxygen of democracy. Let me end by saying, I think there are four areas of work for leaders. I'm regarding you all as leaders. What are they? The first is managerial. I mean, general work's about the most boring thing you can ever talk about. But without good management, you don't get the train on time. Without good management, you don't get the electricity in your home. Without good management, the teacher doesn't pitch. Without good management, the cop doesn't stop asking for a bribe. Management is the organization, the discipline, the engine, the operations, and every HR leader should be deeply knowledgeable about what this organization actually does. Not sitting in an office, not just worrying about remuneration, but in the engine room of how does this organization add value to its markets and its society. That knowledge, the absence of that knowledge is one of the reasons why often with teams of CEOs, I, I hear no HR is other business. You have to, as we've said for years, convert HR to be the business. But to do that, you need to understand the business of the business. Do the products and services 
add value to the people who buy them. It's a managerial job. It's running meetings well. It's budgeting well. It's planning well. It's allocating resources well. It's communicating the stuff that they need to know. Not the inspirational communication, the day-to-day -day communication so the left hand knows what the right hand needs to do. Nehru in India was one of those. He was a he was a technocrat. I think our president is partly a technocrat. He's a bureaucrat. He's run unions. He's run a party. He's run complex processes. He's a process person. He gets it. Management. Do what you say you're going to do and do it well. Second is leadership. It's setting the standard, being the example, helping people in trouble, sharing your passion, inspiring people, having the best ideas, studying hard. I don't mean doing courses. I mean, what's the problem you're trying to solve? And to be practical about it. Degree qualifications mean nothing unless you're able to convert them into action. So leadership is about setting the standard, being the example, high ethical values. Our country, you know, when I watch News 24, I often want to weep at the things I read about what we're doing to each other. Set the standard, an ethical standard. This country is studied now all over the world as a, as a case of state capture, of a society that failed to be vigilant and to be activists. In the 80s, we were activists. We said no, and we changed this country. And then, I think we all moved to Midland. <laughs> <laughs> the third is to be entrepreneurial as a person, to have a culture of looking at the gap. What's missing? The size of the prize. I look at our companies and I think, what kind of people were these Adrian Walls and Donnie Gordons who founded this business school? The Mutsepis of the world who could see what was missing and then provide it. I look around, as I drive around the country and talk to ordinary South Africans in rural and urban areas, you can see what is missing from their lives. It's our ability to Find that and deliver it makes for greater. None of us would have imagined that Silicon Valley would become the center of the global economy. I went there 30 years ago. Stanford was surrounded by farmland. Now it's surrounded by the best companies in the world in one generation. None of us would have imagined that Dubai, which was a sleepy little port, I grew up in the Middle East, has become a center with five other major cities. We would give our front teeth to have cities like that. Some of us have. <laughs> be entrepreneurial. Seize the wind of the time. And lastly, be disruptive. Don't be suicidal, but be disruptive. Say no. Say this is not right. I look at the great disruptors. I'll just give you two. One I don't like, one I admire. The one I don't like is definitely a disruptor. He's an orange president. <laughs> and he's disrupted the United States, probably for bad, but he's a disruptor. Mm. When I watch him on television with his strange things, <laughs> when I watch how he engages, I, I see a guy who I don't agree with, but he's just, woof, he's going. Deng Xiaoping is my man of the 20th century. If you've never read his life, go and read Deng Xiaoping's life. Deng Xiaoping totally turned China upside down, lifted 700 million people out of poverty, all under the Communist Party, all in the space of 40 years. It's never been done before. He was a disruptor. He said, I don't care the color of the cat, it can be black, it can be white, I don't care, as so long as it catches mice. And they began to let the market function in China. And China's a mystery for the West because we don't understand it. We have markets and then we have government. They haven't rolled into one. Great, great disruptor. So let me end by thanking you for inviting me. Our job, lead the learners. Our job, specify the problem you're trying to fix. Our job, more action than thought. Our job, smell the green shoes that are coming. They are coming. Watch in the next 18 months. I suspect we'll start to turn around this amazing country. Thank you.
achieve, what we set out to achieve, what people gave their lives for us to have the freedom to be in this room and to be who we can be. Thank you very much. We've got um, some questions here for you. Um, welcome to those people who've uh, entered. Um, very warm welcome to those speakers and delegates alike. Um, so we've got tons of questions we need to fill. I must tell you a story about this. Sure. Go for it. So Madiba was very strict on being on time. And uh, if you came late to a meeting, what he would do is make a note of your name. And then when the meeting was finished, he would call you. And what do you think he would say? I'm so sorry you were late. We really missed your input. I apologize that we started without you. That makes me feel so much better now. <laughs> Alright, so a uh, question from Anonymous. First of all, we'd love to have your name and surname because we are giving away prizes. We've got four people of yesterday that received the most likes from their peers for their questions and statements. So it would be good if we could get a name to these. But Anonymous says, asks, how can we build leadership capability, whereas the government is politically influenced and our leaders are not appointed on merits? So, I mean, this is the thing that I think all of us are thinking about. How do we balance the state and politics with business and the economy with civil society? And how do we hold our leaders accountable? And how do we make sure the best go into politics? Politics is the highest form of leadership. If you study history, if you study history in all parts of the world, it's the quality of political leadership. The best should be in politics. So I look around now and I ask MBA students, I ask you, you know, do you, have we got the best in politics? Because here's what I believe. Politics drives economics. And good politics makes good economics. So that's the one side. Is the role of a party in a, in a democracy like ours, you know, we pay the price of being a constitutional democracy. We have law courts and we have free media and we have parliament. We are not China. China doesn't have civil liberties. We have civil liberties. You have rights. Put the constitution under your bed. Get the Karma Sutra out and put the Constitution in. <laughs> because that is your warranty for your personal freedom. Hold the politicians accountable. Be politically engaged. Because if politics are going to wreck your economy, your organization, and your future, then it doesn't make sense not to be active. Hold them accountable. In the state, we don't pick... We, it's the weirdest thing. It's 2019, and we have a deployment committee. What? The Youth League, the Women's League, the SACP, Kasatu, and the NEC will meet to decide who to appoint to an SOE. What? This is 2019. And look at the record of their selection. Huh. That was meant to be a joke. <laughs> <laughs> look at the record of selection and look what's happened to SOEs. It's not your ideology. We, we accept you're a citizen. We want the best leaders. Is that right? Mm -hmm. So this we must insist on. That's your role, to insist on it whenever you can. And don't think they're so far away they're untouchable. They're not untouchable. We removed a president here. We removed a president with a little meeting. No tanks. <laughs> Just a little meeting. Uh, Sam, Sam Sima asks, Nick, what is it that makes our lawmakers and government leaders not listen to what advice from experts like you are offering? I, I'm just one small part of a very big puzzle. But I, I want to share with you that you are also a part of a puzzle and assert your rights to be counted as a part of the puzzle. I've made my way through life. I've been privileged it because I was white at one time. <laughs> I'm not white anymore, as you can see. You know, I often ask the MBA, do you think I'm a white male? They look at me like I'm nuts. I say, I'm cross-dressing. <laughs> I, I was privileged to be a white South African. I know that. I'm aware of it. I've made a 
contribution to public life for the last 40 years. I'll keep doing that until the end of my days. Because this country has invited us all to contribute. And you're invited to contribute. That's our system. Our system is if we get a bad outcome, it's because we did that. So I talk to government most of my time now, more than 60% of my time, is unpaid to Mambina work, working with business and government to try and generate domestic investment. That, that's where my time is. Final question. Yes. In closing, um, how can we abolish meetings and still keep in touch and moving forward? Uh, which thing? The answer to how we abolish meetings is this. Hi, Ben. Okay. Thanks, Apple. Let's <laughs> <laughs> well, do a check. How many are Apple people in the room? How many are Samsung? Wow. Let me, let me just end with this. As we talk. Think about this. So the United States is the dominant economy, culture, and military system in the world. By far. You know, people think it's in decline. I invite you to go and drive across America as I did. You won't find much decline. You will find people who still think they run the world. And their products, and their language, and their movies, and their music does run the world. But think about South Korea. There were more Samsung people here than, than Apple people. Think about this. This is a country that 60 years ago, the average earnings was $100 a year per person. 100, 1,400 rand per year. Now they've got Samsung. I want to go to South Korea. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Rob. We've got a little bit of a few from IBM and the board of leadership. Thank you so much for the full provoking presentation. Sorry, Professor, uh, sorry, Prof, is Hyundai from, also, where is Hyundai, man? Hyundai, also from the same Samsung? Because I've got a Hyundai accent here that's uh, got its lights on. Windows are open. Windows are all open. Uh, CN91Z. G, I think. G, GP. Unisa. That's a Unisa car. All the windows are open. But it's a safe place at Sunset, it's fine, don't worry about it. <laughs> so, um, thank you for your questions. First of all, I just want to explain something. Um, I'm going to, we're going to hand over admin to uh, Professor Yeh. There's a few other questions that was asked, which you need to reply on your iPad. If you have an iPad. Or, I don't know what you have. Tablet, I don't know. Um, so, so, thank you for your, for your feedback, for, for those who have just arrived. Um, that is all the Wi-Fi connectivity uh, passwords and codes. Um, the access code IPM 2019 SC, which is a secure Wi-Fi to us. And then please log into Slido so that you can participate in the polls as well as your questions and statements. And please like your peers' questions. There's some prizes I'll be giving away as soon as the lady walks in with all the prizes. We'll do that.